unpopular demand today cut the clutter it's about this very odd very strange and very scary incident of an indian brahmos missile having been fired accidentally or in error or because of a technical malfunction and landing 124 kilometers inside pakistan this happened on the evening of march 9 now thanks to our raksha mantri rajnath singh's statement in, in parliament we also know the time when it got fired it got fired at 7 given the speed of a brahmos missile which can go four times the speed of sound it is almost like a chota level a hypersonic missile it must have taken no more than 4 or 5 minutes if it if it got fired from any of the bases in the northwestern sector in india the pakistanis say sirsa government of india does not specify which place but there is a general indication it wasn't sirsa it's possible that pakistanis only began to track it from sirsa or maybe because they plotted back its trajectory they got to sirsa we don't know that i have also seen some reports also one in bloomberg that says that it was fired from bala but again i am not confirming that i don't know now that is the reason i have been also a little diffident about not discussing this in cut the clutter many of you have asked me how come we haven't spoken about such an important incident that's because we don't know very much more than what is publicly known and what we might know in terms of what we might have overheard or what our sources might have told us cut the clutter is not the place where we give you source based stories if we are sure of our sources if we are sure of the information then again cut the clutter is not the place where we break stories it will then be then be done by fine members of our defense team that is nehesh alex philip raghav big chandani any of those fine reporters not me so i'm not going by what i might know from sources or what i might have heard i will however make some educated calculations not guesswork but calculations let me first list what we know for sure number 1 an indian missile it was a brahmos got fired from an indian air force missile base now remember that could be anywhere brahmos is usually vehicle launched can be vehicle launched so it could be anywhere but somewhere in the western sector it got launched also it was from a battery that is under the command of the indian air force because brahmos is used by indian air force army and now increasingly the navy as well so this was an if brahmos okay it took off and it went towards pakistan now the pakistanis initially said that this was going towards the west westerly direction and there was an immediate guesswork that this was probably going to the mahajan firing ranges that's in rajasthan deep in rajasthan where indian armed forces carry out a lot of their firing practice and tests but i would rule that out completely immediately because if something is flying from say ambala sirsa halwara any of those indian air force bases in that sector sarsaba that is saharanpur from any of those air bases chandigarh then to reach the mahajan ranges look at the map of india it will have to go through it will have to fly across the indian landmass that landmass is filled with civilian aircraft at all times it is a traffic jam of civilian aircraft at 7 o'clock 7 715 that is the peak time can you imagine what air space is around say delhi airport and generally in north india at that point so there is no way that indian air force or any of the indian armed forces would be testing a missile across the breadth of india at least not without issuing a notam which is the notice to airmen and marines that something is coming in and that's why india carries out all its missile tests on the eastern coast usually from odisha so so missiles go into the sea and that is where uh, areas are then notified way ahead so shipping and aviation all stays clear of it no country fires a missile without warning anybody for a test across its own landmass with so many civilian aircraft in the air similarly to think that somebody might have fired it just to show the pakistanis or to test the pakistani ability to detect it or not and oh pakistanis didn't detect it so fantastic well done hey hello pakistanis aapko pata bhi nahi laga ye aa gaya ab jhoot bol rahe ho you are now lying that you detected it if you had detected it you would have shot it down that's nonsense 
because for the same reason that nobody will fire a missile for testing it across India in Mahajan ranges, you will have to be completely daft or you would have had smoked or drunk something really bad to fire one over Pakistan because that airspace also is filled with civilian aircraft. Can you imagine the consequences if you hit a civilian aircraft on the way? So this was a mistake. Those are things that we know for sure. Now the Pakistanis said the flying time was 3 minutes and 44 seconds. It could be 4 minutes and 14 seconds or whatever. It doesn't matter. The next thing we know is that the missile did not have a warhead. It did not have an explosive. Because a Brahmos does not carry a huge explosive but a 200 kilo explosive and these are specialized explosives. On a Brahmos hitting an inhabited area would have caused quite a bit more destruction than it did. So that is, that is a saving grace that no lives were lost because then pressure in Pakistan for a retaliation etc. would have been much stronger as we know their politics right now is very unstable. It would have been very difficult for them also to manage this, to de-escalate this if any lives were lost. We also know that, that the Pakistanis did not pretend to retaliate. Pakistanis actually handled it and responded with a great deal of maturity. They responded a day later and again I see some social media chatter and some sort of fun, ha ha ha, you only found, found out a day later. These things don't happen like that. And nuclear weapon powers do not interact with each other like that. I'm quite sure, I have no information about it, but I'm quite sure. In fact, I'll be, I'll be damned if this turns out to be incorrect, that as soon as this happened and whatever time it takes to convey a message to Delhi, etc, etc, the DGMO on the Indian side or somebody in his office got in touch with the counterpart on the Pakistani side and said that, look, we have a loose missile, we didn't fire it, something went wrong, it doesn't have a warhead, please calm down, this is not an attack, right? Because there is no way otherwise that Pakistanis would not have reacted immediately and the Pakistani army spokesperson would have been so calm the next day. In fact, if you look at the reactions, the Pakistani Foreign Office, the Pakistani NSA, who are also addressing the global diplomatic community and who are also addressing the domestic political uh, opinion, they are the ones who have been a lot more strident than Pakistan's armed forces. Because armed forces probably know the risks involved in this business. So that is as much as we know. Now, what lessons does it teach us? First of all, it teaches us, as the Defence Minister himself said, uh, Rajnath Singh said, that look, we have to tighten our protocols. How did this happen? Now, if you were testing a missile to see if it is in the state of readiness or not, and suddenly an operational situation develops, can you fire a missile or not? Then for, for it to be actually fired, that means all your electric circuitry etc were on. In fact, from what I understand, this launcher had three missiles. Uh, one was launched and immediately power was cut off to the, uh, to the vehicle. So others also do not get launched. So you have to now strengthen your systems because next time you may not be so lucky. Next time the other side may not wait or the other side may find out earlier and do launch on warning because Pakistan's nuclear doctrine we don't even know. They have a very poorly defined first use doctrine. They also have tactical nuclear weapons. So those will be under the command of say tactical commanders on the field, say a core commander, right? And that core commander could use these if he feels under pressure from say an Indian assault. So the situation between India and Pakistan, the nuclear situation is not as stable as we may have wanted it to be. The two sides are not talking with each other sufficiently. So this is a warning now that India and Pakistan have to strengthen their protocols and have to strengthen their communication. In this case, I'm quite sure the communication between the DGMOs work. But now, now that we are nuclear weapon countries with a lot of nuclear weapons, India is building a triad. Pakistan is getting tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons are the ones with low yield, say 1 kiloton, 2 kilotons, which might be used in a battle uh, to deter the other side. But given, given, this, given this great diversity now in nuclear weapons and platforms, the two countries also need to set up a nuclear hotline amongst themselves. It's not as if the two countries are not aware of this. As far back as in 1992, 
in 1991 india and pakistan came very close to a war in 1990 91 more in 1990 than 91 <laughs> india and pakistan came very close to a war and that is when pakistan sent a warning to india that in case there is a war they'll open it with a nuclear attack on india and india realized at that point india did not have a counter a deliverable counter that is something we spoken about earlier but as soon as india got a stable government after vp singh chandrashekar narsimha rao came in government of india and pakistan signed a protocol in 1992 and this was a protocol and this was an agreement not to attack each other's nuclear installations that means anything nuclear not just military installations but say a nuclear power plant a nuclear research lab they decided because to attack a nuclear installation means you might release a lot of radiation and then the retaliation also will be equally brutal so both sides came to that agreement 1st of january every year even during the worst troughs in our relationship 1st of january every year the two sides exchange a list of their nuclear facilities so as new facilities come up or some are shifted they make a solemn disclosure to the other side that these are my nuclear sites you don't attack these and i know that you are giving me a list of your nuclear nuclear sites i won't attack them this happened this year also but now i think with so many missiles because india and pakistan over time also signed an agreement on notifying each other about ballistic missile launches now you know ballistic missiles go up and they come down like this following the usual parabolic route but these are cruise missiles so india pakistan protocol on notifying each other does not involve the cruise missiles one reason is that both countries don't yet have cruise missiles which are nuclear capable so contrary to what people seem to believe brahmos is not nuclear capable that is the reason india is able to export brahmos say to the philippines now which wants to buy a bunch of these so under missile technology control regime mtcr which which regulates all missile trade in the world and also make sure that any nuclear capable missiles are not exported sold or bought mtcr sets limits brahmos passes the test of mtcr so can be exported it is not nuclear capable and probably because both countries have thought that look our cruise missiles are not nuclear capable we don't have to add that to our protocols but i think now if a missile is coming at you and even a cruise missile can go high and then come down and hug the terrain it is necessary now to add cruise missiles to your protocols as well now i will do three more things after this i will tell you that india and pakistan we have had a hostile relationship for 75 years now we in fact were born as new republics at war with each other right in 1947 and we have had many near things and many incidents which have also seen loss of life when i say many incidents you will say all right with the two, our countries are fighting wars there will be loss of life no peace time incidents and i will just list some for you second i will list for you some incidents where two nuclear weapons powers the big powers soviet union and the us almost came to war completely because of errors or or misperceptions or false alarms and third i will tell you using some jazz from a publicly available source on what happens when a nuclear nuclear weapon hits a city because i find very often that people talk of nuclear weapons lightly acha theek hai let the pakistanis drop all theirs on us we will drop ours on pakistan we are more people so more of us will be left so we'll win the war it doesn't work like that a nuclear weapon is not an oversized daisy cutter daisy cutters remember the big bombs that the americans used in afghanistan to blow out those tora bora caves no a nuclear weapon is something entirely different so i will i will use that jazz to play a little game with you also now look at india pakistan incidents on eid day in 10th april and you have to see the story that my colleague raghav big chandani wrote on this also i will share a link with you on eid day 10th of april 1959 indian air force thought that day pakistani air force will be not so alert and they will be because of the festival so they sent a canberra photo reconnaissance aircraft the canberra is a big plane used as a bomber and also for photo reconnaissance because it can go very high 
and can travel very far. It has a two-man crew, so a pilot and a navigator. So this aircraft was sent. It was somewhere over Pakistan towards the territory of Gujarat, district of Gujarat in Pakistan. That PAF caught it on its radar. And one lone radar controller in Peshawar identified it. And there was a combat air patrol of two Sabre jets. He launched them. And they chased this Canberra. Usually Canberra, Canberra would have flown so high that a Sabre would not reach it. But in this case, the Canberra sort of tried to turn back, lost some altitude. It was later said that the aircraft had some oxygen trouble, so it had to come a bit lower. So it was shot down. So that aircraft was shot down on 10th of April 1959. Its two-man crew was taken prisoner. Both of them were released exactly the next day. So these two crew members were squadron leader J.C. Sengupta, who was the pilot, and flight lieutenant S.N. Rampal, who was the navigator. They were released the next day. The Pakistani pilots were flight lieutenants Muhammad Yunus and Nasir Bhatt. Both countries were able to control the situation after that. They figured that something that, that, that a mess up had happened and they let bygones be bygones. And then we saw that big incident on 19th of August 1999. Remember, this was just less than a month after the war in Kargil actually ended. And at that point, a Pakistani Navy Atlantic, you will see the picture, it's quite a sizable aircraft. It is used <coughs> for long range, it was used, now it's, now it's obsolete. It was used for long range anti-submarine warfare and reconnaissance, maritime reconnaissance. That strayed into India and two fighters, two MiG-21 MiG FLs were launched from Bhuj. And it seems that they made the calculation the plane was coming into India and despite warnings was not go going away. So one of the two MiGs, this one flown by squadron leader Bundela, Prashant Bundela, shot down this Atlantic and all 16 aboard was ki were killed. Pakistan claimed that the aircraft was shot down in their territory because most of the debris was found in their ter territory, but it was too close in that area. That area is very messed up. Pakistan went to International Court of Justice which rejected their case a year later. But the fact again is that Pakistan did not make a very big deal of it. So our two countries have known how to handle these tensions. Now in the missile age, when there is no time, when your cruise missiles are flying this fast, nobody is going to take any chances. And that's why it's important for India and Pakistan now to rebuild their protocols, to now revis revisit their existing confidence building measures and add some more. I know these look complicated. I will share with you a paper from SIPRI, which is the uh, Swedish Peace Research Institute. And they had this paper on what can be done in South Asia or in the subcontinent, which is the term I prefer to bring about nuclear stability. So no wars take place or no disasters take place by errors or by miscalculation or by errors plus miscalculation. Now read also this article that Tara Kartha, who has worked in the past at the National Security Council Secretariat at a senior level in India. She's our columnist. She wrote mentioning some cases. In this article, she mentioned some cases where US and, Rus and Soviet Union nearly came to war or had near war-like alerts or false alarms. Now reading that article, I also found a link and that original article by Alan Phillips is from a website called nuclearfiles.org. So I'll share that article with you. But that article also in turn is based on a book and it's a landmark book by Scott Sagan titled Limits of Safety. And that, that article lists 20 occasions on which America, the Western powers and the Soviet Union nearly came to war or alerted their systems or went into high gear alert because of false alarms. So I will not list all for you, but some out of these. And you can see how miscalculations can happen. Sometimes it also happens with a combination of distrust and coincidences. So November 5, 1956, that is, this is when the Suez conflict is on and Britain and France are attacking the Egyptian armed forces to open the Suez Canal. And the Soviet Union warns them. Soviet Union says, look, you stay out of it. You should not be fighting in this war. At some point, Soviet Union says that if this goes on, we will launch missiles on London and Paris, but these will be non-nuclear missiles. That is November 5, 1956. Now, November 5, 1956, Scott Sigrun lists four things that happened. One, 
information came that there were lots of unidentified fighter planes over Turkey, combat planes over Turkey. So what the hell were they doing there? They must have been coming, quote unquote, from the Soviet Union, right? That means Soviet Union was launching war. Number two, that about a hundred MiG-15s, that was top of the line Soviet fighter at that point, about a hundred MiG-15s were seen over Syrian skies. Hell, so that means Soviet Union was getting into the Suez conflict. Number three, that a British Canberra was shot down over Syria. Wow, so three is more than a coincidence. Three is a straight line. And if three is a straight line, what if it's four things happening? So a Soviet fleet, naval fleet, was then seen leaving Dardanelles. Remember Dardanelles and Bosphorus, the two, the two straits we spoke about the other day, that connect, say, uh, Black Sea to the rest of the oceanic system in the world, uh, controlled by Turkey. So four things now. Four can't be just coincidence, isn't it? Just on the day when Soviet Union has said they will launch missiles on London and Paris, unless Britain and France desist from attacking Egyptian forces to reopen the Suez Canal. This tension was lowered, I think both sides talked with each other. In the course of time, research explained why each one of the four incidents had happened and what was each one of these. The first case, unidentified aircraft, fighter aircraft over Turkey was just a flight of swans. That confused people, neurotic people at that point into thinking that this was a swarm of fighter planes. The 100 MiG story was vastly exaggerated. There were some MiG-15s in the air, a bunch of them in the air, but nowhere near 100. But that's because Syrian president was coming back from Moscow. So these aircraft had gone up to escort, maybe ceremonially, his plane landing into Damascus. Number three, a British Canberra had gone down in Syria, but it had gone down because of mechanical failure. And fourth, what was seen as Soviet fleet leaving Dardanelles, was part of an exercise that had earlier been planned and notified. Now, a combination of all these four on a fraught day like that could have led to the Third World War. And there were many other things that happened. In fact, if I look at the 20 incidents, say about 14 or 15 will be during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I will mention just one or two of these. So, August 23, 1962, all communication in North American command and Supreme Allied Command in Europe, all communication went down. And immediately a conclusion was drawn that the Soviets were doing it, you know, the stuff that was happening in, Go in, in, in Cuba around that time. What happened because of that shutdown was that the Allied forces lost all control, all contact with what is called as BMEW bases, that is the Ballistic Missile Early Warning Bases, one at Thule in Greenland, second in a place called Clear in Alaska, in America, and third, in filling dales in England. So they lost contact with all three. And, and an immediate con conclusion was drawn that the Soviets had found a way of blocking all this communication. And once again, Allied forces and Americans went into high alert. It was later discovered that all that had happened was that these communication links were passing through a center in Colorado, in America. And there, a motor had heated up. And because of the overheating of that motor, this communication had broken down. Other similar stuff happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. October 24, a Soviet satellite exploded and immediately a conclusion was drawn that this means a massive ICBM attack is coming from the Soviet Union into America. And precautionary steps were taken. It was during this period that Americans lost a Titan missile test. Now, usually during the Cold War, Americans and the Soviets kept their missiles and their warheads mated. But when they tested something, they demated it. So this was a missile which had been demated. And this test went on because nobody, while, while a warlike situation was on and DEFCON 3 alert, which is the highest level alert at that point, that was on, nobody remembered to tell the team that was to launch this test, that they should not launch a test at this point. So test was launched and once again, crisis management had to be done. And then the funniest of them all, it now sounds funny. So at one American base, that is the Duluth Sector Direction Center, the sentries thought that somebody was climbing, trying to climb the fence of the base and fired at that person. Now, whatever may have happened, it set off alarms. And it set off alarms all over US Air Force bases and also klaxons at bases as far away as Wisconsin. And that's where a flight of F-106A fighters took off presuming, the pilots presuming that World War III 
had started. Later they found out that the intruder in that air base was actually not a human being, even not a spy, it was a bear, Bhalu. So this tells you, it's funny right now, but this tells you what a disastrous consequence these miscalculations can have. There are other incidents, a B-52, American B-52 carrying nuclear weapons crashed not far from the Russians, not far from the, from the Soviets. Pilots had ejected and fortunately, while the aircraft crashed and the fuel burned, the nuclear bombs did not detonate. And you can imagine if a detonation had taken place that close to Soviet Union, what consequences it, it could have had. So these, during the Cold War, both sides learned their lessons and they improved their communication. And how, and how do you improve communication? By building trust. But as Ronald Reagan said to Mikhail Gorbachev, trust but verify. They also built in mechanisms whereby they could verify. Now I will, I told you I'll play a little game with you and I'm not doing any more of this. Now this is something, a public source, a publicly available information that we pick up from a website called nuclearsecrecy.com and I thank my colleague, our national security editor Praveen Swami for giving me the reference to this, nuclearsecrecy.com which has something called a nuke map. On that nuke map, you can decide which city do you want to nuke, right? And what mega tonnage do you want to, your kilo tonnage do you want to use? So we have used for our convenience, the kilo tonnage of this biggest bomb that Pakistanis are supposed to have tested. That is 45 kilotons. So what happens if a 45 kiloton is bombed over Delhi? Imagine. 396,000 people will die in the first 24 hours, another 13,35,000 will be injured. Mumbai, 6,63,000 will die in the first 24 hours and more than 2 million seriously injured. Kolkata, 6.68 lakh will die in the first 24, 24 hours. Bangalore, again you drop a 45 kiloton device on Bangalore, God forbid if that happens, 4,59,540 people will die. And you will see on the screen this tamasha, this sad tamasha going on as I talk. And if you think I am self-flagellating, I am only talking about India, you can take this, you can, you can take this, you can detonate these 45 kilotons anywhere you wish. You can go to Shanghai, lakh and 39,600 killed and many, 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 nearly 9 lakh injured. You can go to Lahore, more than 2 lakh killed. You can go to Karachi, nearly 2 lakhs killed, lakh and 51,000 and lots and lots injured after that. So I'm not wishing and in fact, I'm not wishing this should happen. I'm in fact praying that such a thing should never happen. But can you imagine if such a thing did not happen intentionally but happened because of an error because of because of because somebody lost their minds because a system failed a protocol was not kept that is the fear and that is the reason why this brahmos incident is a warning it's a warning to india it's a warning also to pakistan because nuclear weapon powers have to be very responsible powers